Hello and welcome back. This is Systems Design 522, Fundamentals of Artificial Intelligence, taught at the University of Waterloo in the fall of 2023. Um, I'm Terry Stewart. Um, this lecture is uh, Recurrent Networks. Um, I promised at the end of the previous lecture that it was going to be um, Modern AI. Uh, I forgot about this lecture. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> If you really want to skip ahead, there will be another video next on uh, the, on how we all the res all the stuff that we talk about in this course um, connects to modern AI. Um, but we definitely have to cover recurrent networks before that happens. Um, all right, what do we mean by recurrent networks, and what's the the core task? So. There's one fundamental issue with all of the neural networks, indeed all the systems that we've sort of talked about so far in this course, and that is their output is dependent on their input right now. Right? There's no sense of time. There's no sense of um, if there's some sort of pattern coming into the network over time or coming into the system over time, can you detect that? It's always the output is just purely a function of the input. Um, and that's an interesting limitation. Okay. So it's always, you know, um, you know the, I mean, it's kind of nice if the input that I put in like a second ago is not affecting the output right now. It's just, you know, I don't have to worry about what that previous in input was. Um, but sometimes I might want the past to influence what I'm doing right now. Um, and so, for example, um, here's some data from an, e an ECG signal, you know, some sort of, you know, we're measuring some sort of data um, from a, um, you know, heart rate, um, and we've got some sort of electrical signal coming from it, and it's changing over time. Okay. Um, and depending on what that pattern is over time, these are very, very different sorts of, um, you know, this is a normal ECG up here, and there's a bunch of sort of problematic situations down here. Um, it would be nice to have systems that could detect that, and notice that. Um, now we should, we, we got to be a little bit careful here, because this is really only a problem if I'm like saying, okay, well, the input to the system is just whatever I'm measuring right now. If I wanted to, I could always just sort of say, oh, I don't know, the input to my system is not just what I'm measuring right now, but also all the data over the last, I don't know, second or two seconds or four seconds, however, some amount of time into the past, I might just say, okay, all of that data there, that's my input to my network right now. Okay. If I want to go that approach, fine, ignore all the stuff in this lecture. Um, you don't need it. You can just simply say, all right, my output is still dependent on my input. My just My input is just bigger. Right? as opposed to my input being just the measurement that I'm making at this moment. Um, there's some problems with that approach. You could, you know, now you've got to make, make a decision on how big that input is. Um, you know, then you, you might want to like, okay, instead of just feeding in the raw features, maybe I want to do some pre-processing, extract some features out of it. I don't know, take the Fourier transform, do some sort of processing on it um, before feeding it into the network. Um, so you know, the same sort of feature extraction problems come up. It's also just a lot of values. If I've got, you know, if this is data measured at like, I don't know, a kilohertz, and this is two seconds, that's 2000 values being fed into my network. Um, so that's a lot of connection weights, a lot of features to figure out to extract. So, so there is some size practicality issues there. Um, but that's definitely an approach. Um, um, it would also be kind of nice in those situations. Um, uh, there's this slight issue where um, if I did like take this sort of whole slice of like two seconds of data and feed it into my network, um, I should probably also take that whole slice, but like shifted by one millisecond and shifted by one millisecond and shifted by one millisecond because I don't really care exactly the pattern, you know, like, I don't care exactly the phase, um, you know, if, if I take this whole heart rate pattern here and shift it by 10 milliseconds, it's the same pattern. I should get the same output. Um, a normal neural network, if I'm just feeding in a bunch of data like that, um, it would need to learn that, oh, okay, shifted versions um, are all about the same. Um, I'll give the same output, but would have to learn that by being given lots and lots and lots of examples of shifted versions. Um, 
so, you know, maybe it would be, you know, that's at least just, just a problem when we're, as we're scaling up to these larger systems. I can still learn that with enough data. Um, so fine, I could avoid everything in this, in this lecture. Um, but maybe we can make, we can say something new, um, about this sort of, this sort of temporal problem, this sort of pattern specifically with things over time, especially since biology has to deal with this somehow, like, you know, biology doesn't, you know, if, if, if I have some sort of like sound or some sort of pattern happening over time, I don't have anything in my head that sort of like makes an exact copy of this sliding window of the signal and then feeds that into a neural network. That doesn't seem to be anything like that in the brain. It's much more like, okay, I'm just going to feed in whatever the value is right now, feed that into the brain and the brain's got to deal with it. So if I want my output to be dependent on more than just my input, I got to do something to change in this in this structure. Okay. Um, so if my if my if my output if my output over here, um, you know, with with this sort of neural network structure, my output is dependent on. Fine. If this output is dependent on some way to sum from these features, it's dependent on some way to sum from these features, it's dependent on some way to sum from these features. If that's all my network is, then my output is ultimately only dependent on my inputs. So I need something new. And the idea, you know, in the right in the name in recurrent neural networks is cool. All right, if we're going to do this neural networky thing and we want the output to be dependent on the past history, let's add some new connections. And in particular, what those connections are doing is they're saying, all right, this whatever's happening at this layer is not just the weighted sum of these features, but it's also the weighted sum of my own features from one time step in the past. So that's sort of what's implied in this sort of recurrent connection. It's this same idea. It's still taking my feature values, multiplying by some weights, adding it all up. That's my input. We're just also going to include, all right, taking these feature values from one time step ago, multiplying by some weights, and that's also going to be added into here. Okay. So conceptually, completely the same. What we're, but now what we're doing is we're just simply saying some of the features are just whatever the features were, values were one time step ago. Okay. Um, and it tends to be the feature values of ourselves. And technically we could also do feature values from here with a one time step delay. Nobody does that. It tends to be from yourself one time step delayed. Um, of course, as with everything else, um, if you're going to do these sorts of weights, well, now you're like, well, now, now I got to learn them. And how am I going to learn them? Well, the same answer as with everything um, that is sort of slowly being taken over AI, fine. If you have a bunch of weights and you have some sort of target output, well, just do backprop. Um, you know, write out the error, adjust the weights, take the derivative. You can write out the math of what the derivative of all this is, um, and fine. You can still say how you would change these weights um, to produce that output. Um, this is called backprop through time. I mean, it is just backprop. Um, people also highlight just if they, if you want to draw attention to the fact that we're doing this um, across some sort of time steps, um, it gets called backprop through time. Um, and because it starts being sort of complicated to think about, um, people start coming up with different ways of di drawing this in terms of diagrams. So this diagram down here would kind of be the sort of the minimal example sort of version of this. So I've got some input X coming in here. It's being multiplied by some connection weights U that's giving me my new features. And there's going to be some nonlinearity there. Um, and then these features, these, well, but with these features, they're not just taking the values from the input times these connection weights. They're also taking the old value of the features, multiplying by some other connection weights, adding together H times B plus X times U. That becomes all of my input into this. Then I apply the nonlinearity. Right? Um, and then, of course, I have this output layer of weights. Um, we have uh, from H, we get another set of weights. That'll get my output. Um, okay, so I guess this diagram down here is kind of like this diagram down here, except without this layer. Okay, so it would be just going right from here to there. Okay. 
But that's that's our core idea that this arrow here, that's this set of connection weights. Um, in order to make it really clear that this arrow here also involves a one time step delay, um, you can also rewrite exactly this same diagram in this form over here. And this has sort of become an industry standard for writing any of these sorts of temporal networks. Um, and what we're showing is we're just trying to be explicit about what's happening with time here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, different points in time are going to be uh, you know, drawn this way. And so, so drawn across here. So when I'm feeding in a particular x value at time t minus 1, I'm taking that, multiplying it by u. I'm also taking whatever the old... Yeah, okay, let's, let's do this middle one. I'm feeding in a value of x um, at time t. I multiply it by u, and that value is being combined with the old h of t values multiplied by v. That's getting creating this. Okay. And then the output from that, w, goes out to the output. But then that same thing is just repeated before and after. Right. So here, it's the x at the previous time step, is getting my, my hidden features at the previous time step, um, and producing the output on the previous time step, input on the future time step, hidden features on the future time step, output on the future time step. Okay. So these are both just two different ways of drawing exactly the same thing. Um, one reason to sort of draw it the second way um, is this makes it clear what's going to go on when we do backprop. So, so one thing to note is all of these weights are the same. Cool. So that's all those all those W's are the same, and all these V's are the same, and all these U's are the same. But that means that if I want to take the you know if I'm going to take my sort of error, so any, my error signal is fine. I want my um, my output to be so here's the same diagram. I want my output. I've got some target output that I want. I'm going to take the difference between my target output and what I actually have. That's my error. I'm going to, or sorry, take the you know, my loss function. I'm going to take the derivative of my loss function, and that's going to uh, take the derivative of my loss function with respect to my variables, and that's going to tell me how to change the variables. Um, well, when I'm saying I'm say I've got, I know what this output is. I know what the target output is. I'm going to take the derivative of that with respect to these weights. Okay, that's nice and easy. For these weights, it's nice and easy. I can just take the derivative. Um, with respect to that, everything's fine. Derivative with respect to these weights is a little harder because I've got to go, well, there. I've also got to go to there. I've also got to go all the way back. In these weights here, I've got like multiple paths down. I've got to do the derivative of all of those. Um, uh, it, or it's like all of those are going to contribute when I say the derivative of these um, uh, the, the derivative of the error with respect to those weights is going to have a lot of terms in it. That's, I guess, what we're going to say there. Um, it is technically an infinitely deep network. Um, when people go and implement this, you sort of stop after a little while. You just say, all right, that's close enough. Um, um, but that's sort of this a weird side effect that's going to happen. Um, it, yeah, just when you go ahead and take that derivative. Okay. Um, so you get this infinitely deep network. Um, that definitely makes the vanishing gradient problem a bit of a pro um, even even worse. So um, this was sort of an issue that was mentioned before that in that backprop equation, one of the things you end up having to, to do is you're, you're multiplying a whole bunch of things together, including the derivative of your of your um, uh, of, of your nonlinearities, um, and those values can uh, can just make your derivative go closer and closer and closer to zero. As it gets closer to zero, you're slowing down your changing of your weights. You're not changing your weights very much. It gets harder and harder to learn. Um, fine, that's there. But uh, but the same sorts of techniques um, that we mentioned of oh hey look use values um, um, you know just learn for longer. Um, those sorts of things um, are still going to work. So technically, this isn't any really different than uh, what we talked about in the back prop section. Um, so, 
Cool. Um, so these have been around right from the very beginning, right from when Backcrop was invented. It was very clear that, hey, people wanted sometimes to have a network that whose features were based on values of the previous states, um, uh, uh, yeah, previous states, um, have some sort of memory inside the system. Um, and so really early on, there was still lots of exploration of what happens if you use Backprop with one of these recurrent networks in the middle. Um, and a lot of this early work, um, or sort of one of the, one of the sort of like a nice collection of this early work, um, comes from this paper, uh, by Jeff Ellman, uh, Finding Structure in Time. Um, and his particular emphasis is on, uh, he's interested in language. He's interested in cognition. He's interested in the sorts of temporal patterns that people use all the time. Can these networks, because Backdrop's only a very recent invention at this point, and he's going to say, hey, can these things um, learn the sorts of patterns that people um, uh, seem to be using? Because people process temporal data all the time. Right? Anytime you hear language, the meaning that you're getting out of the words is not based on the word that you're hearing right now. It's being built up out of the previous patterns of words that you've just been hearing as part of the sentence. Um, and even, even a particular word, you're only hearing a particular sound at any given instant, nor to even just build up, you know, recognizing a word. I've got to do that by building up um, a, a memory somehow of the different sounds that I'm hearing. Um, how is that process happening? And can Backprop explain this? Um, so, um, we're going to hit a bunch of examples starting from really, really simple things like, all right, here's an input stream and an output stream. Can it learn to predict what the output will be given the input? And in this particular case, what he's done is this input, um, uh, so, uh, sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. The, so the, yeah, the input is a stream of ones and zeros. The output is always just, well, what input am I going to give you next? So this is very much, this is just trying to predict one time step into the future. That's all this network is trying to do. Um, so I feed in a one and the desired output is a zero because my next value is a zero. Desired output is a one. Okay, this sounds like an impossible task if this is a random sequence of zeros and ones. And yes, if it's a random sequence of zeros and ones, the network's not going to learn to do this. Otherwise the network would somehow be psychic. But what he's done is he's added, he's embedded a little bit of a pattern in here. And the pattern is every third value is actually just the XOR of the previous two. So we've got a one and a zero. Um, exclusive OR between one and zero is a one. So uh, for zero, zero, that would be a zero as an output, which you see here, zero, zero is a zero. Zero, one gives us a one and one, one gives us a zero. Okay. So that's the, that's the pattern in here. Everything else is random. And just every third digit is um, is predictable from the previous two. So this is a task where you definitely have to be using your previous data in order to do it. Um, and he specifically chosen an XOR task because we know that that's something that a that you need to have internal features learn to do. If I try to learn XOR just based on um, uh, with where the only features are my my, the previous two are the, the two values in the XOR on. That's exactly where XOR fails. Um, you need to have um, another set of features, right? Um, as we talked about numerous times in the past. Okay, so um, does it go ahead and do this? Um, the answer is yes. Um, and what we're plotting here is the prediction error. Um, so how accurate its prediction is. Now, one thing to notice here, it's not perfect. Um, and again, this is partly just a feature of he's using very small neural networks back then. Um, try this with a more modern neural network. It should be able to do this uh, pretty perfectly. Um, but uh, we definitely get this pattern of, so this is where we are in time, um, and this is the error. And what we're showing here is the predictions are much better for the ones that can be predicted, and then the, all the other ones are just at chance. Okay. Um, cool. Okay. So that's just an initial indication that this sort of 
backprop through time does actually work. We can train this sort of stuff. Um, fine, but that's XOR. Uh, maybe people do XOR. Uh, let's let's that's not really where his interests are. His interests, you know, let's let's focus on real temporal data in terms of things like time, like language. Um, so, but again, we're starting with really small neural networks. So let's do sort of a really made up language or merely made up sounds. And so here, all right, fine. We've got a sequence of letters. Um, what are we going to do to generate this? We're going to generate this. We're randomly going to choose one of three consonants, a D, a B, or a G. If it's a D, we're going to put two I's after it. If it's a B, we're going to put an A, a single A. And if it's a G, we're going to put three U's. And there we go. There's our input sequence. Randomly, you know, randomly generate consonants. Anytime it's a consonant, there's a sort of a very predictable, these are the set of vowels that are going to come after it. That's the data we're going to feed in. We're going to do the same task. Can you predict the next letter that's going to be coming in? Um, how do we encode this information? Because I can't feed letters into a neural network. Um, one option would be what we've sort of seen many times in the past, which is doing uh, the one-hot encoding. So a D might be, I don't know, 10000, and a B might be 01000, and a G, you know, like, all zeros and a single one indicating which value, which letter it is. Um, it's not what he chose to do in this case. He chose here is, all right, let's actually encode the letters something closer to, like, with, with some sort of actual meaning in them. Um, and so he, he chose a particular set of features that are sort of standard set of features from, uh, from linguistics. Um, is it a consonant or a vowel? Um, uh, is it an interrupted sound? Um, is it high? Is it back? Is it voiced? So high and back, those are sort of where in the mouth is it formed? Um, they're all voiced, so the, all of those uh, values are a one. Um, but it's enough information to distinguish each value. Um, so it's definitely indicating you don't have to do one-hot encoding. Um, if there's some sort of meaningful structure in here, um, you can encode it this way. Um, fine. Is what we use. I don't know. Maybe the results would be different with one-hot encoding. Um, be a perfectly legit final project to go play around with that sort of thing. Um, but uh, this is what was done. Um, and again, try to predict the next word. What's your error pattern? Um, and we see exactly what we would sort of expect. That um, all right. Uh, when it comes to a consonant, we you know the consonants are chosen randomly, so we can't predict those. So we're going to be bad on the consonants. Uh, but then after the consonant, our error drops for, you know, the two vowels that come after it, or the three vowels that come after it, or the one vowel that comes after it. Uh, you'll notice, you will notice that the U's here, so after a G, there's three U's. The G, I get a U, I get a U, and then, oh, uh, my error's getting a little worse the more U's there are in here. Um, that tends to be a feature of these recurrent neural networks is the longer they're trying to store information, the harder it gets. Um, so that's, that's a sort of, um, a pattern that at least shows up, um, in a lot of these networks. Um, but the basic idea is there. Now that, however, this is just a pure prediction of all of this information. Because he's gone and encoded it in a different way, we could even then do things like, well, hold on a second. This is how good it is at predicting the particular letter. How good is it at just predicting, is it a vowel or not? Because that should be easier. Right? And that's exactly what we find. Right? We should basically be definitely that we know that after an A, we know that after a letter, or after an A, you know, um, you know if we G, U, 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 fine. I know the next thing is going to be a consonant. And then whatever consonant it is, cool, all right, it turned out to be a B, now I know the next one is going to be a vowel, and then I'm going to be done with vowels, the next one's going to be a consonant, right? So um, so we can also see that it's, it's picked up on that sort of information. Um, all right, so that's sort of talking about letter or sounds within a word. Um, let's go a little farther. Um, let's predict, let's... Let's feed in letters um, and just feed in, like, just some text. So we're feeding in, many years ago, a boy and girl in 
uh, anyway, so yeah, so that's my input. So just some text, take some English text, convert it into letters, um, and we are going to just predict the next letter. Um, and here, yet another encoding scheme. We are going to just, for every letter, I have a particular pattern of ones and zeros. Right? I've got five bits there, so that's 32 possibilities. We're only dealing with lowercase letters, so cool. We've now got all the possibilities. Right. So this is just a completely arbitrary mapping from letters. Um, well, I guess it's alphabetical order mapping. It's A is 0001. Um, and uh, we're just going to code things that way. Can I predict the future? Okay. So partly this is testing. Can I, you know, does any sort of encoding scheme work? Yes, it does. Um, there's probably lots of trade-offs depending on your, on your encoding scheme, but that was not part of what he's exploring here. Um, instead, can I predict the next letter? And of course the answer is yes, to a certain degree. What interesting things come up out of this? One really strong result that he's got here now is fine. All right, predicting that first M, that's really hard. I got no contacts whatsoever. I don't know. But then, okay, after an M, uh, all right, I wasn't great at predicting the A. It could be many different letters. Uh, but once I've got the M and the A, N's a pretty common thing to have next. And after M, A, and N, a Y is also a pretty common thing. So you get better and better at doing this prediction as the word goes on. But then once that word is over, you now have a big prediction error for the next word. So this is many years ago. A boy. Now oh, this is interesting. So it, it didn't perfectly separate out A from that. But a boy sort of becomes, you know, sort of it's, that, that's, a, that's a coherent chunk. It's not quite what we call a word, uh, but it's definitely a chunk that, that stays together. Um, girl, live by the C. Anyway, by looking at the error prediction, we're starting to get a system that can start to segment. Uh, oh, sorry, by, by looking at how, what the what the error is in the prediction, we're starting to get a system that, just given a stream of letters, can segment those letters into something pretty akin to what we call words. Right? Um, kind of, you know, that's. Kind of interesting that we can actually get that just out of one of these pure next word prediction systems. Right. Um, we can go. Um, so so that's that that's sort of an exciting result um, that we can um, start getting. You know, the features of language start popping out, um, especially since you know, even like you know before written language, if we've just got sounds coming in, like in a, in a real sort of biological scenario, which would be a bunch of sounds coming in, we definitely need a system inside our minds to segment those sounds into words. Um, and this is an interesting hint that you might be able to do that based on prediction error. Um, all right. Um, what else can we do with this? Um, uh, more complex grammar, more complex um, uh, languages. Uh, so um, we're starting to actually put together sentences now um, where we sort of build up a sentence out of, okay, I have a set of verbs, I have a set of nouns, each verb and noun I have a couple examples of. Um, now we're going to use one hot encoding for the individual words. I'm going to feed words in. Um, and what I'm going to do in this case, fine, the task is still to predict what word comes next. And I'm just going to randomly generate a few sentences that are all sort of like simple things of the form, like an animate noun, a verb about eating, followed by a noun that's food. And the animate noun, what, what are my options for an animate noun? Either a cat or a mouse. A verb about eating, oh, apparently it's just eat, and a noun food cookie or break. So that means that I could make the sentence cat eat cookie, or I can make mouse eat cookie, or cat eat breakfast. I guess maybe this is breakfast. Anyway, and mouse eat breakfast. Something like that. I can generate a bunch of sentences like that, feed them into the network. And now the interesting thing, um, and we're going to using one hot encoding. Again, maybe we're just trying out all sorts of different encoding methods. Um, now, so now we have sentences like cat move, uh, man break car, um, boy move, girl eat bread, 
things like that. We're going to feed in all of those sentences. We're not all that interested in the prediction error. Instead, what he's interested in now is, well, what features does it learn? Because the whole point of backprop is it's supposed to learn good features for the task. Okay. Um, you know, we've put backprop into this weird situation where the features are built up not only about my current state, but also the state of the previous features, and it's a big giant mess. But can we analyze what sort of features it's being learned there? And the way he's going to analyze this is he's going to say, okay, let's take a look at whatever the features are in that middle layer. Um, and for any given input, I'm going to have some average activity for, you know, for any particular word as an input, I'm going to have some average activity for those features. And if every word has some particular activity, that means I've got this interesting mapping. I've just got, a, for every word, I've got a particular activity pattern. And what I could do with that set of activity patterns is, well, do you remember sort of beginning at near the beginning of this course, one of the, uns, you know, the one lecture on unsupervised learning pointed out the one thing you can do if you have a bunch of different data is just, is just do some clustering on it and build up a big tree that shows the relationship between the data. Yeah, let's do that here. So each of these is sort of just the vector, the, the average activity of each of these features. And then we're going to do this clustering. And if we look at then that pattern of whatever those features are in those in that middle of this network, the features that the backprop has learned, however it is that it's representing, say, uh, the noun uh, sandwich and the noun cookie, um, those end up having similar features. Yeah, it's because they're grouped together in the, in the clustering. All the nouns are way more similar to each other than any of the verbs. So whatever these features are that, that the system is, is finding is actually has sort of discovered this concept of nouns and verbs, or at least has features that correspond to that sort of thing, just purely out of this task of next word prediction. So the features that are good for next word prediction also end up being features that do a good job of breaking down um, all of these different words into particular categories. Um, that sort of correspond to the kind of categories that people do. Kind of cool. All right, so that's a big sort of sort of some of the initial explorations a lot of people did with these uh, language models, or sorry, with these recurrent network models um, and sort of trying to connect them to language. Um, but this sort of this general idea of I have a recurrent system and um, uh, you know, I want my output to be dependent on more than just my input right now. Um, in general, that there's a lot of other things you can do with a system like that. Um, we don't have, or another way to say this, we don't have to just do the approach um, that I showed there of, hey, let's just set up a network and we'll just have some recurrent connections and we'll just continue to use backprop across it. So, and I want to switch over to let's sort of identify a few alternatives. Um, so we definitely know if we're going to do something like a neural network, um, we need to have recurrent weights just in order to have features that extend over time, right? So fine, we're going to have recurrent weights, but people did neural networks before they had backprop. You don't necessarily need to do backprop and learn those weights. Um, and certainly uh, when people were doing these sorts of experiments, backprop struggles a little bit. You've got to play with, you got to tweak the parameters. You've got to like, oh, it didn't quite work here. Let me, let me make the network a little bigger. Let me adjust the learning rate. It's very, it was very finicky um, in, in a lot of these early days. So there was definitely pressure to like, are there alternatives? And given that like the early days of neural network or even the early days, uh, you know, before we had backprop, you know, back in the heck, even the perceptron days, um, one thing that people did was just like, I don't know, let's just have some random features and use those. And that sort of suggests, well, why don't we just have a random recurrent network? And, you know, you might, you could train everything else, um, but you could just have a random neural network with that work. Um, right. So that's all I was sort of saying there. Let's not bother recurring. Let's not bother learning the recurrent weights. Just have a bunch of them. Right? But then we don't have to learn it. 
Um, that sort of led to two different um, lines of reasoning. Um, so overall, that idea is called reservoir computing. Um, you have some sort of recurrent thing, some sort of temporal dynamics going on. I can feed input into that temporal dynamics, but I don't really tend to adjust it. Um, all I'll do is find it's going to create a bunch of features that are doing something over time. Um, and then when I do read it, when I do connection weights out of that recurrent thing, um, I might learn those weights. I might do regression. I might do, you know, just back prop on, on just those weights, things like that. Um, so reservoir computing is that whole family. Um, it sort of got created from t uh, two different lines of reasoning, uh, in liquid state machines in 2002 and echo state networks in 2004. Um, they're both types of reservoir computing. Um, the, um, the main difference is that just one of them started by assuming that the individual components were kind of biological in that they would emit spikes rather than um, uh, rather than continuous values. So you had features that were just either zero and one, and that's all that's all you could actually do. Um, conceptually, though, very similar. Um, lots of technical details different between them, but conceptually, one of them was just. Um, uh, yeah, was just doing these uh, ones and zeros, and the other one is continuous values. Um, but both of those um, are out there, um, and they're all in this sort of family of, fine, I just have a large group of recurrently connected neurons, make random connections between them, a um, whole bunch of different options to how to connect them. You can either have sort of sparse connection, um, so you're only connected to like 1% of the other connect, uh, the other components, Um however you want that system set up. Um, the only sort of constraint is you want to make sure that this system, if you'd like leave it alone and don't give it any inputs, you want to make sure it settles back to some equilibrium. All right. You don't want it because, because if it was just like, if I, if I feed some input into the system and then it like just goes off to infinity or it just starts, um, you know, doing some sort of really repetitive pattern. And then I, I feed in some other input and it, it just won't change. Like it's, it's totally possible for this system to just start, you know, following some sort of pattern where a predict where adding in some input doesn't do anything. You don't want that. You want a system that'll sort of decay down, uh, decay back to some steady state in the absence of any input. Fine. Okay. Put in that constraint. You no, know, it should. It can be, you know, it can be repetitive, but it it just shouldn't go off to infinity. Um. Lots of different ways of doing that, um, um, but um, you know, standard things like okay, make sure that connection weight matrix has eigenvalues that are all less than one is sort of one way to do that. Um, lots of different possibilities. Um, so you can build build that structure. You can then feed in an input, um, and then for an output, um, the most common thing that people do is they just have one layer output. And if you just got one layer of output, one set of weights there, you may as well use regression to find those weights. You don't need backprop. Just use regression because you can just solve for it. Um, or if it's a classifier, just do a support vector machine and solve for it. Um, but um, the in theory, you could also just do a multi layer. You, you could have a bunch of layers of neurons here and just do a sort of a feed forward um, uh, neural network. You could train up the weights there. Um, but what this gives you access to is a much richer set of possible outputs. So, for example, here is a system, this particular one is being an example. You've got all this weird behavior in here. This means that you can even do something where, say, like with an, let's say I have my input is a constant over time. So, like, I'm just feeding in the same value over and over and over again. And my output over that same time is a sine wave of some frequency. Okay. That's not something you could do with a feed forward neural network. You could not. I just have sort of an input is my constant and my output is a sine wave over time. That's, there's just no way to do that unless you have some sort of recurrence. Um, and, Fine. You've got a whole bunch of dynamics in here. Something it, you know, that's that's a perfectly uh, learnable behavior. And in fact, in this particular case, it's even learned something even fancier than that. It's, okay, if I put in a value of I don't know what this is, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, something, um, then I get a sine wave of a certain frequency. I put in a higher value, I get a sine wave of a higher frequency as my output. Put in a lower value, it's a lower frequency sine wave. 
put in a higher value, it's a higher frequency sine wave. Okay. Um, so that's, I mean, the only thing that's being pointed out there is that's, be, that's just a wildly different sort of behavior than any of the sort of networks that we've seen so far in this course. Um, are there situations where you want that? I mean, certainly, you know, is this something, you know, maybe this is not necessarily how you might want to actually design a sine wave generator. Um, there's some situations where it might be, but um, this is sort of showing at least a broader range of behavior um, than, uh, than we've seen before. Um, these sort of side indications that are being pointed out here, those are sort of trying to figure, see, see what the individual activity of sort of these individual components of the network. So these are the sort of weird temporal dynamic features that the system has created that we're then going to do weighted sums of those features in order to produce that output. Okay. And all of these features are just randomly generated. These are not learned. Right. These features, we just sort of randomly generated this network, feed in some input, we get some behavior out of it, the only thing we're learning is this readout, the thing that does the weighted sum of these features to produce an output. Okay. All right, so that's reservoir computing. Um, it's sort of a nice, you get to bypass a lot of the learning problems. The learning, the learning situation becomes so much easier um, and tends to be useful if you've got sort of, you know, you might actually have some physical system here. Um, so, for example, I've, I've seen work where this particular component in here is literally just a hunk of metal and your input is um, a, a high frequency electromagnetic pulse, right? And that hunk of metal is going to do something to that pulse and it's going to cause, you know, different, you know, if you, if you measure the electric field from different points in that hunk of metal, um, then you're going to get very different, you're going to get different, um, uh, tr different temporal dynamic transformations of it, um, and then you can do weighted sums of those outputs to compute something else. Okay. So the idea is any physical system that has some sort of temporal dynamics can now be used as a component, and I don't have to especially program it, I don't have to modify it, I don't have to you know, do any sort of learning in here. Um, I might do a little bit of designing such that the features that it produces are vaguely useful features, um, but the only thing I have to learn is how I'm going to combine those features uh, to produce an output. All right, um, so that's one alternative to sort of learning these recurrence things. Let's have recurrence and just don't bother learning and just, just learn elsewhere. Uh, so you don't have to learn your recurrent parts. Um, all right, so that's an option. Um, still something where both the reservoir approach and the recurrent neural networks with backprop approach, both of those in practice tend to struggle with long time dependencies. So um, if something that happened like many time steps ago is supposed to affect what my output is right now, um, accuracy tends to drop. Okay, and again, we saw that again a little bit with the language stuff where um, if it was predicting like a long sequences of the same letter, it was starting to um, trail off by the end. Um, so this led some people to say, okay, these features, you know, this, this sort of recurrent neural network thing that we're building, the sorts of features that if I, if I just do typical neural networky things and just may add a recurrent layer, maybe the sort of features we're getting there are not great for doing long temporal dependencies, um, or sort of for, for patterns that sort of really spread out over time. Um, let's still use backprop to do the learning, but can we restructure that recurrent network so that maybe it would do a better job of being able to have features that are encoded for a long period of time? Okay, so that's going to be our idea. We're still going to use backprop, but we're just going to add, we're going to do a more complex structure for that recurrent network. Um, and this ends up, so the first sort of, uh, this first sort of like widely successful version of that sort of idea is called the long short-term memory. Um, and basically what we're going to do is we are going to replace one recurrent network. So we're going to replace, oops, let's go all the way back, all the way back to this diagram here. We're going to replace this H, this thing here, that was just simply um, a single 
you know, I've got a bunch of inputs, the inputs multiplied by some weights, inputs multiplied by some weights. Um, we're going to do some nonlinearity. That's going to produce our output. We're going to replace that one little component, which is, again, this sort of one layer here. We're going to replace that with, forward to my slides, go forward to my slides. We're going to replace that with this monstrosity. Okay, what the heck is this monstrosity? Um, core thing to point out. If we sort of ignored everything and we just simply said, all right, look, we've got this input coming in that's X. We've got this other input coming in here that is the hidden layer activity on the previous time step. And that information goes into a nonlinearity. And then let's ignore this X. And that becomes our output. All right. That would be the traditional recurrent network. So just this component here, um, we have our input. So X is my current input, H of T minus one. That's what my hidden state was. My, my features were on the previous time step. I'm going to, we're indicating with a sigma here, that's the sigmoid nonlinearity. Um, we're going to do that to it. Um, and then we're going to ignore that X. Um, and then that's going to be our output. Um, that is exactly the same as the old just recurrent neural network thing. What else have we added to this? So the main thing that we've that we're going to be adding is fine. There's a, there's some other data we're also going to get from the past, and let's just imagine this data as something indicating which pieces of the old features, so this vector is the same length as this vector, and this is saying, of the elements in this old vector, what things do you want to keep around? Okay, so this will be sort of values between 0 and 1, and the idea is going to be that once we have this value, I mean, we'll keep it for the future, but once we have this value, we are going to, tan, okay, so tan h, that's going to, you know, Fine, do some nonlinearity on it. That's just sort of scaling it. And we're going to multiply that by our features before we let them leave. Okay. Um, and not only do they let them leave to the future, but also let them leave, you know. So anything that gets multiplied by zero here is not going to get passed on to the future. Okay. So this is going to be a way of controlling what information about the past do I want to lose? And implicitly then also, what information about the past am I going to keep? Okay, fine. How do we modify this context thing? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to modify this. So C for context is, you know, um, what we're going to do, and there's going to be tons and tons of ways of different doing this. This is a particular way that ends up working or that ends up being sort of first published in this paper. So one thing we're going to do in order to create this signal, so fine, we've got a version of it from the past. We're going to also modify this context signal. What I'm going to do is going to take my X and take my H. So the same, in, you know, the input, my input right now and my features from the past. And I'm going to do a little neural network on them. Okay. Um, and that, so I've got my H from the past my features from the past and my current input. I'm going to multiply them by some connection weights. I'm going to add some bias because we sort of always are doing that whenever we do a neural network. And then we're going to pass them through some nonlinearity. In this case, it's the sigmoid nonlinearity. So we're doing sigma. That's going to give me a value. That value is going to get multiplied by my old context information. All right. Fine. That. Okay, so maybe that can be used to like... You know, some values are maybe one there, you get multiplied by zero, and so it's going to say, oh, hey, some particular values aren't important anymore. And then I'm also going to do a very similar sort of thing here. I'm going to get a sigmoid and then also a tan H version. So I'm going to do two more versions of that, again, with different connection weights. One using a sigmoid nonlinearity, one using a tan H nonlinearity. And then I'm going to multiply both of those things together, and that result I'm going to add to this context thing. 
And the idea here is this is something like, okay, here's what are, you know, fine, this is maybe getting rid of paint, stop paying attention to these things, and this is sort of maybe pay, start paying attention to these things. Um, why this particular structure? Because it works, is pretty much the answer. Um, um, lots of different things can be tried there, um, um, but that's... Um, that gives us some way of modifying this value. That's going to be my new context information. That's then going to do, all right, my output is going to just, okay, this is again, this thing here, that's my normal neural networky thing. All right, but then I'm also going to take that output and I'm going to multiply it by this in order to filter some things out. And then we're going to pass that information along. That's the idea behind a long short-term memory. So short-term memory in that fine, it can store, you know, like that would be just the normal recurrent neural network. That's very good for short-term things. This longer term, this longer context, that's going to be really good at saying, okay, these particular features, just store these. Because if these values are near one, everything's going to be fine. It's, this gives the network the opportunity to learn weights that will cause data to be stored for a long period of time. Because again, all of these weights are going to get learned using backprop, weights and the bias values. They're all going to get learned during, using backprop, and we're just going to see what happens. Um, okay, we have a much more complex structure as a component. Does this help? Um, clearly it does, because that's, that's otherwise, I mean, they tried a bunch of things that didn't work as well as this, and this one was like, ooh, ooh, this helps. Um, the... Um, and we'll see a whole bunch of examples um, sort of at the end of, of this lecture. Um, actually, let me jump jump ahead to those. Um, no, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll hit the lecture. We'll, we'll hit these examples at the end of the lecture. Um, this ends up being a sort of a big step forward in terms of being able to do similar tasks to what we just talked about, um, but do um, a better job at sort of storing these recurrent values. Okay. There's also a whole family, once this was invented, there's a whole family of other options of things you can put in here, uh, GRUs, um, all, anyway, um, a big family of other things. Uh, but this is the first one, and it's still actually a pretty standard one. So if you are doing data and you're doing any sort of deep neural network learning things, all the deep neural networking packages have an LSTM in as an example. That will be one of their main examples. If you need outputs that are dependent on data in the past, um, this is probably the first thing that you should try uh, in terms of, of um, sort of standard approaches. Um, um, that said, just normal backprop can also work pretty well. Um, and also, as I said, with the reservoirs, sometimes you don't need, you don't need to do a learning on this at all. You just randomly set things. So that's another option. I do want sort of as sort of a summary on all those. So we definitely, if, why do we want a recurrent network? We need a recurrent network if your output's dependent on more than, than just the current input. Um, again, you don't ever have to do this. You can always feed into your network all of the past information you want. You just have a giant amount of input. If you have a giant amount of input, you're gonna have a giant number of weights. You're probably gonna need lots of data in order to train in order to get those weights, uh, get good values for those weights. Um, so, um, that's, that's part of why people would go with a recurrent network instead. Um, fine, you're going to have, um, you know, backprop is definitely going to be a, a learning method for, for this, um, or you can just use random features um, for the reservoirs, or we can have this sort of complex structure for storing data over time and still use backprop. That seems to be sort of the general organ, um, you know, reasoning behind all these different methods for recurrent networks. However, I'm going to put in a little bit of an aside here that technically should not be in a course on foundations of AI, because what I'm about to talk about is definitely not in the foundations of AI. This is a very new thing that was actually invented at the University of Waterloo um, by, a, um, by some PhD students um, uh, in the lab that I work in. Um, so I'll just, you know, just... Consider this whole chunk here. This is just a bit of an aside um, in terms of where one dir interesting direction where I think the future of these sorts of recurrent networks might be going. Um, 
and at the very least we have some data that it outperforms the techniques that I just talked about. All right, so this sort of aside here, um, oh, and I will also say one of the reasons I feel somewhat justified in bringing this into a course about foundations of AI um, is we do have sort of theoretical arguments for why this would be a good structure. Okay, so the goal is to have useful temporal features. Right? I want to have, you know, I've got some task, I want to be able to feed data into a recurrent network, and I want the features that that recurrent system picks out, I want them to be useful for a wide range of tasks. Um, and sort of one sort of basic thing that those features would need to do is just, can they encode the information about the past? Right? Whatever those features are, do they have, is it, you know, is it possible given those features for me to know what the values were in the past? That would be sort of like the minimal task that sort of should be needed for anything. Um, if my output is going to be handed on the input in the past, I should also be able to have features that could output whatever the heck the value was in the past. Um, so they won't necessarily be the best possible features for the tasks, but they should be pretty good features for a wide range of tasks. Um, and also, once we have those features that are sort of good at encoding the entire past, then I could do like a, a normal layer of, of uh, like a feedforward neural network, sort of a multi-layer perceptron, just do another layer of features, um, and that, that could then, um, we could just use normal backprop um, just to like improve those um, improve those features, or f find better features for that. Fine. All right, but step one is going to be, can I just find features that do a really good job of encoding the past? And what do we mean by best encode the past? Well, here's a function that if I could get my network to do this, that would definitely be encoding the past. Okay, so this is a function where, hey, I want my output to be whatever my input was theta seconds ago. Um, so again, this is like, this is like the opposite of a prediction task. This is just make my output be whatever my input was in the past. So it's sort of the yeah, opposite way around. Do I have access to this information? If I have access to the information theta seconds ago, and I can keep running this network over and over and over again, then not only do I have access to the information theta seconds ago, but I also have access to the information all from now to theta seconds ago. Um, fine. Okay, so this gives us some sort of a mathematical definition of what we want our network to be able to do. So, can we build an optimal system? Like, I don't know, because I don't know what features I want. I don't know. I, I don't know what the right features are for this task. But what, you know, given, given this particular math, can I just straight from math figure out what would be the right thing I could construct such that I would have features that could do this task. Okay, now, um, math is about to get weird here. Um, depending on what math background you've got, this will either make sense or just like, what, hold on. Um, there will be, eh, I would just want to give you a feel for it, what, what's happening here. Um, so, fine, this is the math, the way of writing down in math what I want to do. Um, what do I do with an equation like that? That's bizarre. Well, one thing you can do to an equation like that um, is you can take the Laplace transform of it. Um, what's the Laplace transform? Sort of a standard technique in sort of control theory and engineering to characterize the relationship between the output and the input of a system. Um, it tends to be defined in continuous time, so we're going to be doing everything in continuous time. Um, and then worry about discrete time later. Um, so you know, it's like we don't even have time steps right now. We are literally just having like continuous time coming into the system, um, and I just want my output to be whatever the input was theta seconds ago. Um, this particular thing, this sort of delay operation, is one of the things that there's a little class transform for, um, and um, a delay operation turns out to be e to the minus theta s, so where theta is the delay. Um, one way you could you could read this is if I took this x of s and pulled it up on this side, um, this would be saying y of s is x of s times e to the minus theta s, and so that's sort of just a transformation of this um, 
this function. When you do a Laplace front transform, T's turn into S's and lowercase letters turn into uppercase letters. There's way more to it than that, but that's one quick rule of thumb. Um, and then there's particular um, operations that turn out to be really nice. Uh, so like a delay turns into this. Why would I want to do a Laplace transform on things? Well, again, talking, talking with sort of control theory engineer type people, um, once you have Laplace transforms, one of the things you can do with them is if you have this, you can write a differential equation for that Laplace transform. Okay, why? Uh, all right, we'll just go ahead with this. Why not? Um, now, of course, one problem with this is I can only write a differential equation out of a Laplace transform if this Laplace transform is in the form of a ratio of polynomials, which this is not a ratio of polynomials. But there is a method for taking any function and approximating it with a bunch of polynomials. Again, depending on your math background, you may have heard of Taylor series expansions, or Taylor series approximations. You can take an equation, you can write it as a big you know, as, as uh, the sum of a bunch of polynomials. Um, there's a more general version of Taylor series approximation called Pate approximates, which turns any function into a ratio of polynomials. Um, and if we do it to this task, fine, we get some weird math that says, all right, this is going to be our approximation of uh, e to the minus theta s, it's going to be some ratio and where these components are built out of some sums of these um, uh, polynomials. Um, and then depending on how far you want to go through this sum, you can get a closer and closer and closer approximation to this actually perfect delay. Fine. We've now got this as a ratio of polynomials. That's bizarre. What does that help us do? Well, what that then means is I can use the, that thing I said is that once you have things as a ratio of polynomials, I can turn it into a differential equation. That means this differential equation will give me a system that will approximate this particular, um, uh, this particular delay system. A uh, little bit extra. So not only do we need diff this, so this differential equation, X is my input. M is some internal state. Those are going to be the features that I'm going to be built, that are going to be used to encode the temporal information. And this is going to say how to change those features over time, given the old value of the feature and my input. And this A and B, those are matrices that we can go, you know, through this whole math, we actually just have numbers that just, okay, we can just say, all right, what are the right A and B matrices that make this all work, um, given all this math. So that differential equation, that's going to give us some internal state M, which is our set of features. And the same math also gives us, if I have those features, what weights do I put on those features in order to produce an output that is approximately the delayed version of the input? <sighs> okay, um, what? So I built up a system. This is sort of like the math approach to how would I take this X input encoded in some sort of values M. So this M is a vector um, uh, of, of values. Um, take this X input. I have a single scalar X as my input. Um, I would encode it this way, and then I can generate an output that should approximate that input, and I can make that approximate closer and closer and closer to perfect as I increase the, the length of this vector M which also, of course, increases the size of these A and B, B matrices. Um, but I have some nice math that tells me what the right um, weights are for doing that. Um, as a side note, it turns out that these scaling factors here turn out to be the Legendre polynomials, um, which, again, you may, you know, people may or may not be familiar with, but anyway, they're, they're a thing that already exists in math. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, so there's tons of math you can do on this whole thing. This whole system is called a Legendre memory unit um, because it's called because it ends up encoding all of its information in these M features. Um, now, so uh, and this is the paper uh, where uh, Aaron Volker and uh, Ivana Kajic um, uh, introduced this whole idea, um, and um, 
one sort of aspect of all of this sort of thing, so after we've gone through this horrible, bizarre, so this is sort of like a mathematician's approach to this task. But the point is, once we've got to the end of this whole thing, well, hold on, like, what have we got here? Um, what I've got is something that looks an awful lot like a neural network, and it's particularly a recurrent neural network, right? I've got um, an input. I've got a matrix. So this is sort of like a connection weights from my input into my hidden layer. I've got something that says, all right, I've got some features and I've got some connection weights, and that's going to say how my hidden layer changes their um, uh, changes their state based on the current state. That's kind of like the recurrent part. And this is kind of like the output weights. Right? Taking M, multiply it by some weights, and I get my output. It's not quite a recurrent network. I've got to do one other thing that I have to, because this is all in continuous time. This is all in... Um, you know, assuming time is continuous, and then we have this derivative in here. Most of the time when people are doing neural networks, I'm doing sort of one time step at a time. Right? I've got some input at this instant, and then I've got a next time step and a next time step. Um, nice thing is, again, once you've got differential equations, um, I can go ahead and discretize this. There's a sort of a standard approach for taking a differential equation and, and turning it into time steps. And this is like literally the Wikipedia says, oh, go do this math on it. Um, and now what we have is exactly a neural network. I have my input on some particular time step K multiplied by a connection weight matrix. Um, this is sort of a modified version of this matrix. My features values on a previous on that previous time step K multiplied by some weights. I do all of that, add it together, that gets me my new feature value. Okay, that's exactly the structure of a neural network. Um, indeed, it's even a neural network that doesn't have a nonlinearity, right? So normally what we would have at a neural network, we should have like a sigmoid or something at this point. This is pointing out that, hey, look, the correct nonlinearity for this particular system is no nonlinearity at all. It's the identity function. I don't need to do anything. Okay. Um, so I have this sort of this weird neural network, uh, this weird recurrent neural network where I've solved for, I just have an, I, I have actual values. I just do the math and it tells me what these weights are. This is now a recurrent network that specifically says, hey, these are the best weights. And so I don't have to learn them. I can just fix them. And you know, maybe I'll learn other parts of my network. But this says for the recurrent part, if I know that my recurrent network is supposed to store some data about the past history theta, I can just generate the weights for that. Okay. Um, right. And so this is an optimal reservoir Again, this is sort of trying to draw it as a neural network. Um, this is the optimal reservoir for encoding information over a desired interval theta. Okay. Um, so I can just fix that. I can fix those weights. Other parts of my system maybe do learning, but I don't need to learn those weights. And that drastically simplifies the learning process. This becomes a situation where putting in extra, our own extra knowledge can simplify backprop's task. Um, uh, oh, then of course, once you, if you've got a system like that as one layer, and then if you want to, you can put another hidden layer, another, you know, do a normal neural network afterwards. So this, this little box here is this thing here. So we've got the little box there and then fine, do another layer of ne neurons after that. If you want to do some arbitrary function, because the, this initial thing that we built is only good at outputting what was the value theta seconds ago, but fine. All the information about the past is still encoded in these in, in, in these features. So now now just do normal um, multi-layer neural network uh, training if you want to go past that, if you want to do some other function of the past. Um, basic results from this whole process. Um, yeah, it works really well. So certainly, specifically for the task that it's built on, it is ridiculously better than an LSTM. Just like hundred, you know, thousands of times better. Um, so here is, you know, training up on this task, um, you know, this is error and this is how long a delay we're worried about in terms of time steps. Um, and this is saying, Hey, look, even with like a delay of like 25 step, like, like the LSTM has like really high error all the way up here. Um, the, the LMU, the sort of new approach that we're going to hear, look, I can do tens of thousands of of delays and have way lower error. This is 10 to the minus, this is on a log scale. This is 10 to the minus eight error. And this is a ridiculously better network. Um, 
specifically for the task it's invented on. Of course, for the task it's invented on, I don't even, or it's invented for, I don't even have to do any learning whatsoever. I just literally use the weights the math says are the best possible weights. So, of course, it's going to be better than an LSTM trying to learn this. As a sort of a, a more interesting task, let's let's do something that people have actually, um, you know, tried to use um, LSTMs for, and lots of other variants. Um, so this is called the permuted sequential MNIST task. MNIST is that task with here is a handwritten digit. Please tell me what digit it is. Um, sequential MNIST is all right. Instead of showing you the whole picture of the digit as the input, I'm going to give you the input one pixel at a time and you still have to recognize the digit. Um, permuted sequential MNIST is not only going to give you the pixels one pixel at a time, I'm not going to give them to you in a nice order of starting in the left top left corner and giving you one pixel at a time in some sort of nice order. No, 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 no. I'm going to secretly pick a random order to give them to you. I'll always give them to you in the same random order, but I will give you them to you in a random order. So this is sort of a standard benchmark task for recurrent networks. Um, lots of people have tried lots of different things on it. Here is a whole family of different things that people had tried. Um, so they're all sort of variants of the idea of an LSTM. Um, so I guess, well, sorry. The RNNs, that's the recurrent neural network. A couple of variants of that. LSTM, which is fine, we showed that. And then all of these are sort of variations of LSTMs um, that have been uh, created over, over the years. Um, and we go through all of those, and yes, this particular technique, state-of-the-art performance beats all this, beats the state-of-the-art algorithms um, for doing this task. Um, kind of cool. Um, so yeah, it's just let's just design a network that does what we want. I know what good features are. I can design good features for this task. Um, there's also a really interesting thing, you know, the, the reason we were original, the reason that that originally got invented um, coming out of this lab is actually we were interested in how brains might encode information over time. Um, it also does turn out that if you take that same network and you encode it in sort of biologically realistic neurons um, and run those sorts of simulations, you get very similar patterns uh, of sort of neural activity um, as what they actually do see uh, in rodents. So, um, you know, if you sort of given input input that's like a pulse to these systems. So just sort of it's normally zero and then you give it a pulse um, near, near one as your input. Um, and then you look at the activity of all the neurons or equivalently you look at the features um, going on uh, inside the system. Um, then you get this sort of interesting pattern where, yeah, there's some that are responding right away, some that are responding later, but you get this sort of interesting scaling um, uh, or stretching of that, which we also get out of the model. Cool. So yeah, so there's this whole line of research. There's been a whole line of research trying to connect that more to biology. Um, also, since that paper came out, um, there's been a bunch of people just from the machine learning community that are also sort of building up on that and taking it in different directions. Um, so there was, there was a group at Stanford uh, who expanded it, called it uh, HIPPO, um, uh, Recurrent Memory with Optimal uh, Polynomial Projections. Um, and then more recently, there was this neat summary article uh, in March of 2023 uh, from DeepMind um, looking through this whole family of models and pointing out, that, oh, hey, look, this is sort of an interesting revival of recurrent neural networks um, that seem to work really well for long sequences. Um, and sort of people are sort of exploring that. Um, this field, it's hard. Uh, right now, I think the name that it's sort of settling on is state space models. Um, but there's, there's this whole collection of, of things in that area that I think is an interesting new addition to this whole domain of, um, hey, we don't have to learn our features. We don't have to randomly generate our features. Maybe we can analytically solve for what are good features. Um, and with this various different approaches, um, you can optimize for various different things. Like maybe you want sparsity in your features or um, maybe, maybe you want, instead of a fixed window in time, you want sort of a, um, a, an adjustable window in time. There's all, all sorts of uh, different variations in there, but all of them, I think the core idea is, hey, this is an analytically tractable problem. We can come up with good features and that can really help our learning process. All right. Um, so apologize for that aside. I think it's an exciting line of research um, and I was sort of peripherally involved in its development um, so I I'm just used that opportunity to like ad advocate for it <laughs> all right 
Um, let's back to the lecture. Um, what I wanted to finish off with is um, these recurrent neural networks. Um, one of the things that, like, even right early on, what people were playing with, with these networks is what do they do with language? Um, because that's sort of like the canonical, this is temporal data, data where my output is dependent on, you know, interpreting or doing anything for the language. I'm feeding in, you know, one word at a time or one letter at a time or one syllable at a time, whatever that I'm doing, um, feeding in some data. And this idea of predicting the next letter or predicting the next value seems to come up very often especially since people realize pretty early on that if you have a network that's good at this, um, you should be able to generate text, right? Because I should be able to just feed in a random input, take the output, feed that back into itself, take the output, feed it back into itself, take the output, and repeat. And that should generate text. Okay. Um, and what I've got now is sort of, I've stolen a, um, a relatively famous blog post that sort of, um, that I'll, I'll mention, uh, I'll say more about at the end. Um, this sort of said, had this really nice summary of, fine, let's go take these LSTM, let's take these recurrent networks, feed data into them, do this prediction. How good are they at generating text? Okay, at this, at the particular state of the art, um, we're having here, um, as people listening to this lecture are probably guessing, um, this idea of generating text has something that's become very, very popular in 2023. Um, we will talk more about the, the, the sort of the techniques that um, lead to that. Um, we'll talk more in future lectures. Um, what I want to show here is what's the state of the art given the techniques that I've shown so far. Okay. So um, one thing we do, okay, let's just take some, you know, we, we got to train up our network on some data. So we're going to train up our network on Paul Graham's essays. He's a, you know, he does all sorts of stuff about um uh, businesses and startups and capitalism. Fine, it's a big collection of essays. Let's go ahead and uh, train up some data, uh, train up a network on that, and then feed in a random input, get a get an output, feed in feed it into the next. And we're just doing it one letter at a time, um, and it generates, you know, the so the yeah. it's generating sentences, you know, or well, it's it's at least generating words. Okay, the surprised in investors weren't going to raise money. I'm not the company with the time. They're all interesting. Okay, this is not coherent, um, but it does look like English, right? And again, all we're doing is we're feeding in one letter at a time. Uh, we're just getting the network to predict the next letter, and then whatever it predicts, fine. That's what the next letter is. Go ahead. Um, and we're including space as a letter and punctuation and things like that. Um, so it's at least getting stuff that is like structured, like an English sentence. We're even getting like, like random footnotes, sort of things like that. Um, so that's the sort of information that uh, that sort of network is sort of capable of picking up. Okay. Um, we can also sort of train up a separate network, say, and do Shakespeare. Okay. And then we'll, we'll do it again. So it's trained up on Shakespeare. Um, and now we get, yeah, this is actually sort of maybe a little closer, you know, alas, I think you shall, become approached in the day when little strain would be attained to, into being never fed. Uh, you know, I'm, again, not wonderful, but it's structured right. Well, like it's, a, it's, it's following sorts of, of, of these sorts of uh, commonalities of, of that sort of text. Um, it's, you know, identifying, you know, a speaker followed by some text and sort of, you know, it's certainly not making anything, you know, interesting rhymes. Um, but, um, it is doing something like what this what this task is. Um, you can also have it generate LaTeX. So, like, yeah, this is like fine. Feed in a whole bunch of random like documents encoded in LaTeX. Have it generate LaTeX. They had to do a little bit of tweaking to like make sure the LaTeX you know fix a few things or make make sure the LaTeX compiled so it wasn't perfect. Um, but can generate you know text with like weird you know with math equations and things in it. Um, uh, and, you know, at least at first glance, I've certainly seen more confusing papers. Um, but of course it's going to be, once you actually start looking at these details, you're like, well, hold, hold, hold on a second. This doesn't make any sense. Like assume three and three by the construction. Eh, the moment you start reading, this sort of doesn't make it much sense. Um, but we can do it and it's at least doing something of the right form. Um, 
the, you know, okay, so more diagrams, like really weird diagrams, um, you know, but not bad for all it is. It's just the network is trained. Out. Here's a bunch of text. Please predict the next letter, right? That That's all that's happening here. Um, we can still get relatively compact structures. Um, we can even get code out of it. Um, and uh, so this was trained up on, I think, big chunks of like, like the Linux um, uh, C code. Um or uh, like the the like uh, core kernels, um, and it's you know it's generating stuff. I mean, again, you know, there's some weirdnesses in here. Like that's that's not the greatest if statement. Um, uh, so there's certain things that are a little bit weird, but you know, there's there's some stuff in here where we're using a variable that was defined at least. Um, so again, it's sort of um, this is at least giving a sense of what the capabilities um, of this sort of just purely predict the next word are. Um, this is the blog post that I sort of stole all those examples from. Um, it, well worth taking a look at. I think it just sort of um, an, a really neat exploration and sort of the excitement about these sorts of things. Everything I just showed there, um, maybe right now this isn't all that exciting. Certainly, this is extremely exciting at the time that it came out. Um, and I think one interesting question is, well, how long ago? Well, like, take a guess as to when you think this is the sort of the state of the art. So in, in terms of text generation, in terms of having a, a, an AI system generating text, this is as good as it got up until recently. And, I'm, you know, and this, the, the, the date of, on this blog post is actually 2015. So in 2015, that's about as you, good as you could get in uh, using AI to generate text, to generate the sort of broad range of things. Okay. Certainly things are much better now. Um, and that's going to be an interesting topic of a future lecture is what the hell changed? <laughs> um, because it's not that long ago since 2015. <laughs> um, what changed... Um, and it's also sort of an insight as to why it is that everyone is so incredibly excited about, about language models now, um, given that this is this is what the state of the art was um, very recently, right? And sort of um, certainly in, in a lot of my training, this is this is this is about where we were like, okay, this is what neural networks can do, um, um, and then it's sort of a big surprise that the modern systems have improved on it. How did they improve on it? All right, um, that's it for this lecture. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you want temporal features, they need to get input from the past. Um, and you can either ignore everything in this lecture and just feed in tons of data from the past, but then your network's going to be huge and have tons of weights. Um, or you need to have some sort of recurrence in the network. Um, and certainly something like language definitely requires information about the past or some sort of long window in time. Um, but other time series data like ECG patterns or weather patterns or stock market patterns, any anything with sort of data over time, this sort of issue is going to come up. Um, LSTM is probably still the standard approach. There's tons of variations that are out there. Um, uh, we will talk about what the what's now become standard is what we call transformers. Um, although they're going to turn out actually be closer to this sort of just feed in all the data from the past. Um, uh, and there is this interesting idea. If you're looking for sort of bleeding edge stuff, the LMU that I introduced seems to work really, really well. That said, big caveat, that's not a standard yet. It's and and I have hope for it in the future. But anyway, um, lots and lots of examples of people doing things uh, with this. Um, I find, you know, if people are looking for particular projects for the end of the course, um, the whole set of stuff in Elman's Finding Structure and Time paper, um, I think, gives a really interesting insight into, you know, what are these early things that people were doing with these small initial networks? Nice thing about that is those are all small enough that it's easy to replicate all of that work. Because computers have gotten much better since then. Um, and so then you could do sort of explorations and changing and modifications um, of those of those same examples. Um, but then there's also the blog post that I just pointed out, which is, I mean, nice thing is, all the code for that is available. Um, so then that could also be an interesting thing to explore um, and, uh, and look at different variations on. All right. Uh, that was a very long lecture. Sorry about that. Um, but um, 
you know, in a lecture all about time, I guess I should be bad about paying attention to time. Um, in any case, uh, we will see you later uh, in the next lecture where I will finally get into how all of this connects to modern AI. Thank you very much and see you then.